கருணார்ணவமாய் கருதக்கதி நல்கும் அருணாச்சல சிவம் ஈதா கருணார்ணவமாய் கருதக்கதி நல்கும் அருணாச்சல சிவம் ஈதா Namaste. Welcome to the next episode of Ananya Bhakti. So last time we talked about Ishwara, the controller, or what we usually call God. And today we're going to talk about God's will. God is the source and totality of all the power that we see manifest in this universe. Thus, every single activity or happening here is impelled, driven, and controlled by him. As an ancient Tamil proverb says, Avan arul andri aur anuvum asayadu. Except by his grace, not even an atom moves. So what to speak of the great movements we see of the planets and stars and so on, and even in our everyday lives. So in other words, nothing is going on except by the will of God. And that will is grace, karuna, compassion. And how is that? Because sometimes we see terrible suffering or we see tremendous injustice, amazing ignorance, <laughs> <laughs> and all kinds of things that maybe we think shouldn't be. So how is that? And this is one question that Western theology has never been able to answer. And the reason they couldn't answer it is because they want to say that God is all good. But their definition of good is calculated by human standards. So <laughs> actually, that's not the way it works, kids. The way it works is that the definition of good is calculated from the standard of the self. And what is that? That everyone should realize the self and come back to the self. And give up this individual existence and striving lust and ignorance that causes us so much suffering. Because that's why suffering exists. <laughs> the farther we go away from the self, the more suffering, the more resistance, the more ignorance, the more mistakes, uh, the, the more we experience things that we don't want to experience. So this is the universal law. And it's that way because God, what we see as God, is really just a distorted, partial reflection of Atman, the self, Brahman. So what is the will of God? It is his love just to be. He is the infinite fullness of being, and the nature of true self-conscious being is to love the self because he is the infinite fullness of absolute happiness. What he truly loves is nothing other than his own natural state of being. We use being with a capital B here because we're talking about absolute being, unconditioned being, unlimited, <laughs> beginningless and endless being. In fact, we really shouldn't even talk about it as being or existence because being implies becoming. Existence implies non-existence. But in the absolute, there is no non-existence. There's only existence and there is no time either. So there can't be any past, present, future, coming into being, going out of being, change, transformation, 
or anything like that. So that being is pure love, pure ecstasy, beginningless and boundaryless, huh? unlimited ecstasy. That's God. <laughs> Actually, that's beyond God. That's the self. God, what we know of as God, has a beginning and an end. And that is when we come into existence, into the world of separated individuality, we create God. Because we have to have someone to exercise the power that creates the world. And we just want to be at the effect of that power. We don't want to be the cause of it. So we create God when we come into this individual existence. And similarly, when we attain self-realization, God disappears. There's no need for God anymore because we are all merging back into the self. And the self is the reservoir of all powers. Even though the self doesn't exercise that power because what is there to exercise it on? <laughs> Only the self really is. So this is the difference between the absolute and the relative realities. The absolute reality, there's no time, no space, no position, no motion, no cause, no effect, <laughs> no subject, no object, no nothing. <laughs> Yet there is being, and that being is pure awareness and pure love. Since he is all-powerful, nothing can happen without his consent. And since he is all-loving, nothing can happen that is not for the true benefit of all concerned. Even though our limited human intellect may be unable to understand how each happening is truly good and beneficial. So in other words, like Ramana says, everything that happens is for the best. Everything will turn out right in the end. And I'm here to tell you that that's true. That when you attain self-realization, when you uh, become aware that you are nothing but the self, and that everything else is similarly only self, uh, then you realize that everything that happens is only to bring you back to the self. Everything that happens is the path. We just don't realize it because of ignorance. But as uh, some Zen people say, the obstacle is the path. If you're trying to do something and there's an obstacle, there's a reason for it. You may not be able to appreciate it. You may be frustrated. But that's only because you're deluded by desire. <laughs> desire means clinging, attachment. Huh? And when we don't get what we want, which happens really a lot, <laughs> because mostly what we want is against the will of God. So when we finally get it, then we're unsatisfied. It's never perfect. It's never what we wanted. It's never what we desired. And if we don't get it, then we feel frustrated. Oh, why is God against me? But actually, that obstacle is there to teach us a lesson. We should take it as an object of meditation and try to understand why that obstacle is there. I could go into a whole... <laughs> explanation based on my life experience. For example, wherever you find Saturn in your astrological chart, that's where all your major life obstacles are going to be. Delays, disappointments, uh, everything that goes wrong. We can blame it on Saturn. But Saturn is a kind of guru. Actually, all the planets are. Saturn is the guru who teaches you what not to do. 
whereas Jupiter is the guru who teaches you what to do. And if you're fortunate, you have them in a relationship with each other so that Saturn will chase you into Jupiter's arms. <laughs> I'm very fortunate to have that in my chart. So uh, we can look at everybody's chart like that and analyze. But the really fortunate people are those uh, who are driven by life to attain self-realization in this life. Since God alone truly exists, he sees everything as his own being. Hence, he loves us as his own self. Therefore, God's will is that we should remain only as our unadulterated and perfectly happy self-conscious being, just as he does. In other words, God's will is that we should attain self-realization. So if we really want to please God, then we should get on the path and don't delay because the older you are, the harder it is to change. And believe me, on the path, you're going to have to change many, many things in order to realize the actual benefits. So uh, as the saying here in India, a saint in truth is a saint in youth. In other words, those tendencies that eventually lead one to self-realization manifest very early in life. And, but even if they don't, uh, the time to start self-realization practice is the time when you realize its importance. So as soon as you get it, as soon as you understand, wow, this is the purpose of life. This is what it's all about. Huh? Then, uh, like Osho used to say, don't just do something, sit there. <laughs> this is the opposite of ordinary life, of ordinary consciousness and society. And people will think you're strange. Well, don't you want to go out and do all kinds of nonsense and get intoxicated and make a fool of yourself? Uh, no, thanks. I think I'll just sit here and meditate. Ah, you're no fun. <laughs> but what do they know? Huh? They're going out and creating karma that's going to bind them further to the wheel of life and death. So, you know, if you're staying home, even if you don't meditate, even if you just stay home and do nothing, that's better. So... <laughs> But even better than that is to perform karma yoga, bhakti yoga, uh, raja yoga, jnana yoga, and realize the truth for yourself, because that's the ultimate benefit, and that's what God wants for us. The power of grace. Everything that we experience is shaped and regulated by God's grace, which is the power of his infinite love for us, his all-consuming love that we should just be as the true self-conscious being that is the real self, both of himself and ourself. To experience the infinite happiness of being, we need do nothing other than to surrender entirely to his all-loving and all-powerful will. So everything is happening anyway. You know, I sit here in my little place in the middle of nowhere, way out in the country in India, and people are hustling and bustling and going here and there and working so hard, going around and around in the same old routines every day. And what am I doing? A whole lot of nothing. <laughs> but what am I really doing? I'm really thinking always of the self in his different forms, in his different aspects, and of his relationship with everything, and his will. What does he want us really to do? Well, really, as Ramana used to say, sit down and keep quiet. <laughs> that means instead of running around, 
doing this, doing that, getting all entangled with karma and cause and effect, to just contemplate what is the real truth? What is really going on in this world? What is really going on in your life? How did it come to be this way? And most importantly, how do we withdraw from this duality, this delusion, this ignorance, and remain at one with the real self? As a finite mind, our power is very limited, and we are confused about the true nature of the reality, which is our true self. Therefore, we can never experience the absolute clarity of true self-knowledge by our power, that is, by the power of this inherently confused mind. Huh? The mind is ignorance, because the first thought in the mind is I. I as a separate being, as an individual, as an individuated consciousness, huh? which is really a joke because there ain't no such thing. <laughs> consciousness is consciousness. Huh? It's just space. It's emptiness. A, a space where stuff shows up. And what shows up? The whole universe, everything, even God, shows up in our space. So then who are we really? We are the self. We are the infinite consciousness. But because we are reflected in a mind, we see only a partial and distorted picture. So the whole point of meditation <laughs> is to go beyond the mind, not to expand the mind, not to transform the mind, but no, not, not even to purify the mind, but to go, beyond, <clears throat> to go beyond the mind completely. And then we can realize our real nature. Huh? The mind is always going to be confused because the mind is based on I. That's why Ramana counsels us to meditate, who am I? To take a look at that root thought because as soon as we see that this I is illusory, and the whole thing blows up. <laughs> the whole mind dissolves in ecstasy to realize that actually this separate I doesn't exist and has never existed. And this is the aim of the Buddha's path. This is the aim of the Vedic path. This is the teaching of Ramana and of all enlightened, realized beings. To experience that true clarity, we have to depend entirely upon God's infinite power of grace. Grace is nothing other than that true clarity, which always exists within us as our real self, that is, as our perfectly clear self-conscious being, I, I. So the mind can't attain self-realization, and that means no amount of manipulation of the mind will lead us to enlightenment. But the mind has to be dropped, completely transcended. But we can't do that <laughs> because the doer is the mind, the I, the ego. So... That's why no amount of doing is going to bring us to enlightenment. No amount of thinking is going to give us self-realization. We have to transcend all that. Then who is going to do that? Not I, not the mind, but God. That's why surrender to God, surrender to the guru, is the functional principle of bhakti. When that happens, then everything else can happen. The deep meditation of Raja Yoga and the insight and the realization of Jnana Yoga, that I am that. I, I. Huh? Not even I am. 
because I am implies that. And there's a difference between I and that. Even if we say I am that, we're still making a distinction. So instead, this realization is expressed as I, I. There is only subject, no predicate. So long as the mind tries to assert its own self-deluded power, which is only a power to do, we can never experience the absolute peace and joy of simply being. Because this simply being is total surrender. It means we don't take any initiative. We don't act out of desire. We have no object, no aim to achieve. Uh, we are simply being, being aware of everything, but being aware from the point of view of the self. That's the actual jnana yoga, and that's perfect self-realization. But as long as the mind is there trying to do something, it can't happen. It will be blocked. So the whole idea is to surrender, give everything to God the mind, the thoughts, the desires, the ignorance, huh? our actions, everything. Give everything to God and just sit and wait. That doesn't mean nothing is happening, <laughs> which you'll find out if you try it. <laughs> but let God do it. Don't you do it. Don't even ask for what you want God to do. God knows. He'll do the right thing. He loves you. We can experience absolute peace and joy only when the mind entirely surrenders the confused and misleading power of its own self-deluded will and entirely depends instead upon the power of our true and essential being, that is, upon the grace or clarity of our self-consciousness, I, I, which is the power just to be. It is a power in the sense of an ability. It is not a power in the sense of being able to get stuff done. Uh, because that concept is of the ego. That is of the mind. Uh, that I have the power to do this, the power to do that. Well, so what? <laughs> you don't have the power to be. You can only have the power to do. So power is a concept of the mind. And it requires a subject and object and predicate. So again, as soon as you think of power or use power, you're back in duality. Instead, we should think in terms of surrender of non-doing, of simply being. But that being is not static. It's not just sitting there with nothing, <laughs> although it might look like that in the beginning. But really, there's a tremendous joy and satisfaction of being content, or more than content, ecstatically blissful with simply being, and that is the real self-realization. Om Tat Sat, Om Harihi Om. Karunar Navamai Kardakadi Nalgum Arunachala Shivam Yidam